All right, y'all, welcome back to the Musicpreneur Podcast. I got a friend of mine, producer, you know him very well, Ivan Calderon. Today, we're just keeping it super informal. Uh, we are trying a new format out, and because of the fact that Ivan has been a guest on the show, he's actually been the only live guest that I've had on the show, um, and another distro kid, uh, sponsored artist, producer, years in the game, plenty of experience, more than I have, and a lot of really, really good insight. I wanted to make sure that we had a real life conversation, which we've had off camera, and bring it to you guys because a lot of the the things that we talk about and specifically the things that Ivan says are super insightful and are probably not talked about enough in this laid back type of format. Uh, usually we have a cigar and a whiskey. Uh, tonight we'll <laughs> we'll keep it clean with you know just water for now, right? Maybe we can progress down the line uh, <laughs> with that format. Uh, but all right, I've done enough talking. Um, Ivan, man, how are you, brother? Good, man. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be back. Now, before we continue with the interview, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors, DistroKid. DistroKid has been a sponsor of the channel and the podcast since the inception of the Musicpreneur podcast. Not only have they allowed us to produce high quality interviews for you guys, but they also provide great features and benefits to DistroKid members worldwide. Now, as you may know, DistroKid has increased their prices, but it still costs less than $2 a month in order to be able to upload unlimited amounts of music and distribute worldwide. There's a ton of features available for DistroKid users, and there are some upgrades that you can choose, inclusive of syncing your lyrics on Spotify and Instagram, and having the ability to upload your music videos to places like Vivo and Apple Music Videos. So if you're not a DistroKid member already, I highly encourage you to check out DistroKid and take advantage of a discount link that I have available for you guys, distrokid.com forward slash VIP forward slash Nico Santana. Now back to the podcast. Yeah, no, thank you for agreeing to this. And um, I hope to have you more as a permanent guest slash co-host. So we're experimenting with that. And obviously we're trying to figure out what works for the both of us because um, we were talking offline and although we're very similar in many ways, weird respects like as if we had been separated from birth and <laughs> kind of intertwined in like some sort of parallel universe and whatnot uh there's also differences that are key to um having ivan's point of view be very valuable and something that i can't bring to the to the table and so um yeah so we're trying it out but um yeah so i'm talking a lot here as i always do um i wanted to touch on a couple topics here tonight if that's cool with you and whatever you have in mind yeah, man. to talk about uh, one thing that you mentioned before we started the recording was um, this is like music or creative entrepreneur therapy. So I want to get a gauge of where you are, how you feel. You're a full-time producer, yeah. you're a YouTuber, content creator. Let's peel back the layers, man. Yeah. What's that? What's that feel like? What's that look like? What's your What's your day to day? How has your uh, progression been? We might have to pull out the whiskey after all. <laughs> oh, let's go. <laughs> um, I've been good, man. You know, it's funny because I just had this conversation with another good friend, longtime friend, um, who was also at one point involved in like the music scene. But she asked me the same question, like, you know, how is everything? How's business? How's life? And it's funny because, um, you know, I've done, I've known that I loved music. As far back as I can remember. And I've been blessed enough to be able to do this full time for the last like six years or so. But, you know, it, it, it everything I feel like eventually reaches a point where it does become work, right? The goal is to eventually find something that you still enjoy doing, but you're going to, you know, eventually get past the honeymoon phase and, it, and eventually it still becomes work. Like there are days, I'm not going to lie to you, where even though I work on what I love and, and my studio is here in my house, so I don't have to travel places, I'm still like, dang, I don't feel like it today. Like today, I just want to not get out of bed or maybe just, you know, turn on the, the PlayStation and just not do anything. Um, so it does require a little bit of, a, a lot of bit of actually internal like discipline. But, you know, I'm at that point right now, at least for me in my business, where I am looking for different ways to scale, to bring more revenue, so that way I'm a little bit more hands-off, um, and I can do other things in my life, not necessarily like away from music. I, I love music. I actually want to do that so I can focus more on working more music, because right now, um, we've talked about it, but a big part of my business is the music side, and then the, the YouTube side, which is like a whole nother 
like facet of of the business that's more like video side video production the youtube algorithm all of those things so i'm i'm looking to kind of scale in a way where that becomes a little bit more automatic and i can focus more on the actual like music production i've been starting to do that more this year actually putting out some more projects um but yeah man you know just kind of you know learning day by day figuring it out as every entrepreneur does and just trying my best I think the challenge for you and for a lot of us creatives is that, and we were talking about this offline, is that we're tied to our to our art in a very specific way. And so when art feels like work, it it's almost soul crushing, right? Because Dude, yes. Yeah. So speak into that because that struck a nerve with you. Yeah. So it's it's crazy because like at one point, so this ties back to what I was saying. At one point, mm-hmm. music was like the escape the hobby right you leave your nine to five and you come do like the thing that just like fuels you and i'm not saying that i've lost that fire up i mean obviously like i wouldn't do i'm choosing to be here right i could get another job and i'm choosing to be here um but it is one of those things where like it becomes work it's it's you do it because you love it but also because it pays the bills so there's that little bit of pressure to like i have to create which in a way kind of takes the fun away from it just a little bit um but yeah there's that it's it's a balance it's a balance because like i said you have to you have to find that middle ground from i like to do it but also i have to do it because i have to continue to you know pay my rent or whatever yeah the the having to do it has always limited me and maybe this is a self-limiting belief into wanting to pursue just music full time, which is why mm. I've always kept something else in my back pocket. I mean, obviously financial obligations are a thing, but like even when I was independent, I didn't have a wife, children to take care of. I didn't have a mortgage payment. Um, and I was living off of literally, I could live off of like a hundred dollars a week. Right. Yeah. Um, or less, honestly, there was still something else that I attached to, uh, making money that mm. did not require me to perform, under some sort of creative pressure. So you could still keep the creativity of the music? Mm. Yeah. And I yeah. felt that young, at, at a very young age, I think there's a couple documentaries that I had watched specifically to uh, the art of hip hop and yeah, uh, good one. rappers. and Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I always felt like I wanted to have something that brought in the money that wasn't tied to the music because then I would have to compromise the music in order to make the money. And I'm not saying that everybody has to do this. I think there's a yeah. lot of artists that have a sweet, have found a sweet spot to do both. But dude, that, that is the challenge of like the creative entrepreneur, right? It's like, if you take a passion, uh, something that you're passionate about specifically in the creative field, and now you have to turn it into a money-making machine. Yeah. Like where, where is that balance? I mean, I know it's yeah. hard to answer that, but like, what are your I mean, thoughts it's, on it's that? true. A hundred percent. And it's funny that you mentioned that too, because I feel like now that I think about it, the YouTube side of things, I, don't get, I, I enjoy video. Obviously, audio is still like my my passion, my thing. I enjoy video, but now that I think about it, I guess I'm trying to build my YouTube side to be that thing. Because now that I'm thinking deeper into it, the the part that feels like work is the YouTube side. Because that takes up a significant amount of time. I don't think people understand like the amount of hours that go behind a video from, you know, it's not like 2008 where you just upload whatever you felt like saying that day and you know you just shared it with your friends there's a whole algorithm now so you have to do research prior to even you know you have to think of like the titles what what are the audiences searching for what are they interested in the title is a title going to be enticing enough the thumbnail a lot of these things that now i'm thinking of before i even write the script then there's the writing of the script there's a delivery i mean there's so many things that go behind the scenes but uh to your point i th- I think, yeah, I 100% agree. Um, I think ideally, and this is, again, from our my perspective and I guess yours as well, there has to be two. Um, but ideally, for me, they both have to be somewhat creative. I, and this again, just me, I just have a hard time keeping a real job. And mind you, I've worked for... Fortune 500 companies. I at the at the ripe age of 22, I was doing research analytics for Viacom in New York City, getting paid the most I was ever getting paid at 22, and I still hated my life. Like I was I was li- I was living in New York City. Uh, my office was in Midtown, and I still wasn't happy. Um, so yeah, I think I think at least for me, I want to get to a point where like that YouTube side is just kind of 
passively flowing, and I'm saying that like very lightly because there there really is no true passive income. You still have to do some work, um, but in a way that kind of facilitates the income finance part of it where I can focus more freely on what I love, which is the music. So yeah, I do agree. I think like if you, you have to have at least like something to not fully be burnt out on that creative endeavor. Yeah. And you could switch back and forth, right? Like if you are in a season mm-hmm. where maybe you don't feel creatively vibrant, right? You're not tied to putting out Ivan Calderon albums and singles and, you know, collaboration yeah. tracks with people because you have that revenue to fall back on. I think that's also been kind of like, I've, I put out three songs in the last two and a half years, yeah. you know, and, and I'm okay. Like, I don't, I don't feel like I'm not an artist, but it's just not the season in my life where I can pour into music the way that I did before my twins were born. Like yeah. before, you know, I had basically two day jobs. Like it just, you know, it's not the same time frame, you know, and, and I'm okay with that, but I still have that itch. Like I still have that desire. Yeah. I've talked to you about it multiple times. I'm like, dude, we got to work on a track. Every, every single artist that I've had on here, we always talk about, we got to work on a track. We got to work on a track and I'm all about it. It's just, fortunately, as you mentioned, it's not something that like I need to fall back on. Well, you know, what's crazy. I think the deeper question here then, not just for us, I mean, I feel like we are pretty dialed in into what we want, but maybe for others is what do you want out of music, right? Facts. Because here's the thing. If your dreams are maybe more akin to mine, right, where you don't necessarily want to be the biggest thing in the world, you just want to pay your bills, then then I would say what we just talked about is a good approach. Maybe, f- uh, you know, have the music, but then have something that is still creatively enticing that can pay the bills or and then kind of work in tangent off of both of those. Um, and that's one way to do it, right, certainly. But if your goal is to be like a touring artist, someone who is like maybe on billboard charts or whatever, then that's a whole different strategy, right? At that point, you got to play the game. At that point, you have to be heavy on the promo, heavy on the releases. It's kind of like the YouTube thing, but in music, right? You have to be more tuned in to basically have a a strategy for releasing. So I I think it really just, it's a matter of reflection. Like, what do you want out of this music thing? Do you, because, you know, if if your goal is to, to be that big superstar, but your work ethic is more aligned to what we're talking about, it's not going to match up. You have to be, and it's it's funny because I just saw you post that earlier today, the little like a Instagram story of like Spotify cares about your release strategy and, you know, like all these little things that people don't necessarily think about. Um, So yeah, it's just a matter of like just having that inner reflection. Like what do you really want from music, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question that I had to ask myself is why am I doing this? Because Mm -hmm. I went from wanting to be kind of like the underground rapper, like hip hop artist to then doing like faith based music with a group, being able to tour na- nationwide and being like, oh, maybe I can make a living off of this, but like not a comfortable living, just enough to like scrape by as a single guy. Yeah. And then from there, like having a family and, you know, having those responsibilities, it completely changes you. But I always came back to like, why am I doing this? You know, and at least for me, man, again, going back to the music therapy thing, like it almost came down to like validation, right? It's like, yeah. I want to be liked. I I enjoy the feeling of being appreciated by people who've never met me before when I was single, whether it was pretty yeah. girls or like just guys, you know, like that appreciated what I did, like w- whatever it was, you know what I mean? But it seldom had to do with like the music itself in terms of like the actual mm. promotional aspect, why I wanted to be a touring artist, touring artist. Those things specifically were like more tied to like my own inner dealings and like traumas that I had to work through, yeah. um, you know, confidence issues, things of that nature. After working through those, I'm like, all right, what do I really enjoy about music? And it's like, I enjoy expressing myself. Yeah. Do I have to do it all the time publicly? No, I actually mm. don't like, you right. know what I mean? So it's like, then why am I hinging my whole career on trying to be you know a sh- like showcasing my music touring yeah. ar- artists when ultimately like that's not what's fulfilling and like I would I will say this like when I was actively pursuing that it's probably when I hit like one of the sec- second or third lowest points yeah. in my life you know what I mean because like I just wasn't cohesively there and it didn't match up right and you know and that's probably because there was a misalignment between like what you actually wanted and what you thought could get you there 
you know? Right. Um, and again, it's just a matter of deep reflection because I'm kind of the same way. You know, I think in the beginning we all have big aspirations and not to say that that's bad. Like if that's your dream, then, then pursue that. Um, but, you know, we all start out with like at least, you know, on the production side, oh, I want to produce for big artists, the Drakes and the, the whoever's. Um, but as I'm starting to get older, man, I'm, you know, I just turned 30 this past uh, February. I enjoy my mental peace. I enjoy being on my own schedule, which is why I can't do a regular job. Um, I enjoy being able to just kind of flow through life as I see fit. And, and that requires me to do what I'm doing now. Obviously, I'm still working to get to where I want to be. But, you know, can you imagine also, like, if I was, like, a traditional producer, maybe I was signed to a label or whatever, there would be certain expectations of me to deliver, right? If I was signed to, like, if I had, like, a pub deal or some shit, like, or some, some stuff like that. I don't know if I could curse on here. I'm you sorry. say it, man. No, you're good. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Um, um, yeah, you know, like, if I was under certain expectations, uh, you'd have to kind of do those things out of pressure, um, and, right. and, you know, I just, I just enjoy my freedom way too much. Um, yeah. but again, everything, everything has, you know, their caveats, uh, yeah. everything is still work. I think it's just a matter of like finding, doing some questioning about who you are and what you want, specifically what you want out of music. And then how does that look like in an outward kind of, you know, perspective to, to make sure that you get there. Yeah, you hit, man, you hit something that I said to myself, uh, actually to my wife earlier today. It's choose your heart, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the difficult exactly. path that you want to Because we're all going to struggle, but you have to pick something. Facts. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So you have to choose one, and it's not all glitz and glamour. Like, you see Ivan, you see him in front of the, you know, on, on your YouTube screen, crushing it. But, like, behind the scenes, my man is dialed in. He's got a whole system, processes, like, from the recording, the scripting, the editing, everything is like super dialed in. And I actually wanted to touch on that real quick, but yeah, man. yeah, it's like, it's crazy the amount of work that you put in to YouTube video that literally takes 10 minutes to watch. And you know, Dude. most people don't even watch it to the end. Nuts. Nuts. Which is crazy. The, you know, and I kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but yeah, it's a lot, dude. I, mm -hmm. I used to take way longer. But I think, you know, as you do with anything, as you do something, you get better with it over time. But yeah, you know, like nowadays, because the algorithm is so prevalent, you know, like it doesn't even matter like how many subscribers you have anymore. Uh, they'll show you whatever they think you'll like based on your view history and a bunch of other metrics. But it's it's to the point where you have to do you have to think about what your audience has uh, been receptive towards in the past. Uh, you have to think about the title, the thumbnail, way before you even think about, like, press and record. Because the worst thing is, like, if you you think you have a good idea for a video and you record it and you go through all the trouble and then no one watches it, wasted effort. Even worse if there's a sponsor, at, at, like, t attached to it. Because now you're just, you know, not delivering uh, on what they basically paid you for. So there's a whole bunch of work beforehand. And then not even counting the actual work. So the actual, you know, I script all my videos because even though I think I'm fairly articulate, I tend to ramble sometimes. And I like to be efficient. So I'll script my videos. There's a recording, the editing, which you know plenty of, and then the distribution, right? You have to make sure that you're also posting at the right time times and there's there's a lot and now there's the whole you know youtube shorts reels tiktoks you have oh, to man. i saw you posting you know some short form content finally i was uh, i say finally because no 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 you're <laughs> absolutely right 100 percent. you're not the only one who's been telling me i have another friend also creative entrepreneur who's like dude you're you need to post on like these short form stuff but here's the thing um, I guess I also choose my hard in, in this realm because YouTube, as much as I love YouTube, that is a job now, right? Instagram is my fun place. Instagram is where I go just to goof off. I'll post little stories of irrelevant things, maybe some trips that I'll take. I'll keep it mostly music, but, you know, I guess in a way, subconsciously, I've been staying away from posting consistently there because I don't want that to turn that into a job. That is like yeah. my social media getaway from YouTube. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, like, it's important. I was talking to my wife about this earlier where I feel like, and, you know, correct me if you think differently, but I feel like, as much as I hate it, Instagram has become like your online, like, like a profile. 
right? Aside from maybe Facebook, but if, if when you meet someone new, like what's your Instagram? Let me add you on Instagram. That's kind of what you first get like this glimpse of who that person is and what they do. So there's still a mm-hmm. level of importance. <clears throat> so I was testing out, you know, some, some short form content. Maybe I'll get into some sort of routine, but I don't know if I'll ever do it like as rigorous as some of my, you know, um, some of the other people in, in this space, because I just, there's still a part of me that doesn't want that to become a job. <laughs> You crushed it, man. I, I'll tell you that much. You crushed it on the short forms. And honestly, if you see it from, I just got to create YouTube shorts and I just so happen to post it on Instagram, maybe that mental distinct uh, distinction can kind of still help make Instagram well, kind of like a, your fun place. You know You know what, though? I think a lot of it is mental barriers. And, and if you're mm-hmm. a creative entrepreneur, you probably understand this more than anybody. But Facts. it's funny. Um, so I posted, I think, two reels last week. I kid you not. I, I, I just explained to you why I've been staying away, right? It's like this huge mental like block. That first reel, which was uh, over like a Cato uh, like audio thing that he posted about doing what you love, it took me 20 minutes from beginning to end, from beginning to post. And that was yep. literally me just having an idea of like, oh, what if I just do this? And obviously I have this room set up in a way that is um, – practical and efficient for recording so i literally had the the tripod in the corner i set it up i did some takes i'm good enough at editing where i put it together and then at the end i was like well this wasn't that bad (laughs) maybe i could do more maybe i've just been lying to myself and you know just kind of getting in my own head and getting in my own way but um yeah i think what i'm going to start doing just to kind of be more methodical about it is maybe because Fridays are kind of like my um, uh, light days in terms of work. I might just use that to create a bunch of reels. Maybe I'll start off slow two or three a week for the following week and then just kind of schedule those out. We'll see how it goes. I enjoy the process of reels because I feel like there's not so much at stake. Like Mm. if you don't watch 50% of the video, that doesn't mean you haven't watched four minutes of grueling editing that means you didn't watch 30 seconds or 15 seconds it's true tops. man yeah. you know what i mean like so the offer in, ter- in terms of audience retention like i don't feel as crappy as i do on youtube when i'm like you didn't watch the other half that took me like three hours to craft and edit and put together like damn like you only watched the first three hours <laughs> you know or that that i took you know, to make that video so yeah i think i'd have to agree with you um and not only that but you also think about the the different um not necessarily demographics, but maybe the the purpose, right? Maybe the audience. I guess it would be demographic, but um, on Instagram, the the perspective is completely different. You are going there for quick little bites. You're not necessarily going to watch ten minute, excuse me, videos. So, um, and a lot of times, it's not even necessarily. Like, they don't have to be complicated. I've seen some people do some real... You do this very well. It's just you at your desk and some inspirational kind of audio behind it. And that'll resonate with somebody, you know, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever. And and that kind of keeps on going. And then to tie that back to the point that I was saying before, it is important. <laughs> as much as, you know, we, we say it isn't because at the end of the day, uh, what I've been kind of realizing is that at the end of the day social proof still matters let's say that subscribers don't really matter anymore it's still some sort of metric for people to gauge maybe at what point you are and obviously there's there's some caveats and nuances because you can buy followers and you know not with the meta thing that you can buy but it's it's if you're trying to at least do this on a more professional level i'll tell you this now and anybody who's listening I've been on calls with companies, big companies, sponsor companies who still abide by the subscriber rule, right? They'll be like, oh, you only have X amount of of subscribers. You're on the uh, micro influencer category or whatever. So we can only do this for you. And I'm like, but dude, I'm getting like thousands and thousands of views a month from evergreen content that I've created over the years. Like, my channel is doing great. You'll get exposure, but no, no, no. You know, they're, they're still kind of viewing that metric. So in a way, it is still important to make sure those numbers are still up to par. Yeah, you have to know what audience you're playing. And going back to the mm-hmm. whole work versus hobby, it's ultimately like, and this is the, something that I learned the hard way with music specifically as an artist is, are you trying to appease the gatekeepers or are mm-hmm. you trying to get people to like you? And if you are trying to make, you know, kind of that... um transition from whatever you're doing right now to like full-time artist youtuber what have you like 
you kind of do have to appease the gatekeepers because ultimately they're they're paying your bills, they're booking you for shows, they're getting you right. to play stadiums or festivals or whatever the case is. Even if you don't like it, I mean that goes back to paying the bills. You know what I mean? Choose your hard man. I feel like that should yeah. be the <laughs> the official motto of this episode, a hundred percent. And and we all yeah. kind of have to definitely choose our avenue of hard. If you're on YouTube, like for me, it's my it's YouTube. If you're an artist who really wants to make it out like a like, you know superstar, like we talked about before, then it would be that. Um, if you're primarily on Instagram, and I know plenty of my colleagues who are um, doing what I do with YouTube, but on Instagram, that is their thing. So a hundred percent. Again, you just have to ask those questions to yourself. Like, what do you want? What do you want out of this? What do you want? Yeah. Yeah. Writing that down, understanding yourself. There's a lot of that, like, inner work. And I was talking to another friend of mine who is an entrepreneur, but he does it in not the creative way. Mm. And he said that one thing about entrepreneurship, because he's a a pharmacist by trade. So, like, that's his thing. Hated it. Soul crushing. Mm. Found, like, I could do something outside of this that makes me equal or more money. Yeah entrepreneurship and he what one one benefit that he found through the process of like pursuing some sort of business and specifically like just entrepreneurship solopreneurship was the personal development side and working on himself and understanding himself and deficiencies weaknesses a lot of the stuff that like you don't really have to think about when you just clock in clock out you clock out have a couple beers go to sleep and then you're back at it and it's just very surface level a hundred percent no definitely um being a business owner, and I relate to, to all of that because being a business owner has been by far the hardest job I've ever had. The most fun as well, the most liberating, but definitely the most hard because you're right. Um, when you're kind of you know on a regular job, and this is not a knock to anybody who has a, a nine to five. I mean, those are those are fine. Um, but but there are days where you kind of just work on autopilot, right? You don't want to go to work, but you clock in. Maybe you do the bare minimum, but those hours still get clocked in and you still get paid. It, until you build some sort of passive system as a freelancer or like you know anything of that sort if you don't get up and work then there's no money coming in so you learn you do learn a lot about yourself i've learned that i am in like intrinsically and naturally lazy and i have to work really really hard to not be <laughs> so you know it's it's one of those things where like recently I'm like, okay, I wonder how much time, because the problem that I had was like, oh, I didn't get to finish this, maybe this week or or this day or whatever. I'm like, I wonder how much time I'm just like goofing off in the studio, like procrastinating, maybe watching a YouTube video or whatever. I started using this app called Time, Time or Timing, I'll have to look it up. But I love it. It's a time tracking app, and I usually hate all of those because it requires a lot of input on your end. And I'm like, well, I don't, you know, like I'm, I want you to do it and then tell me what I'm doing. This one basically automatically tracks on the background and it tracks what app you use or what website you're on. And then you can assign that to subgroups or categories that you've created. And they even give you some to start off. But I started to realize based on hard numbers that I was actually wasting maybe like two to three hours a day on unproductive things. So I'm like, okay, so clearly there's a deficiency in time management and maybe just, you know, being uh, lack of productivity or whatever. I don't have to say that you have to be on all the time, but it, it definitely lets you know. Entrepreneurship lets you know where you are lacking for sure. Not only that, maybe also patience, right? Because it does not come quickly. Maybe, you know, it is on marketing because at the end of the day, no matter in what industry you're in, it still has to, sales have to happen for you to make money. So you have to find that audience. There's a lot that a hundred, it a hundred percent teaches you about. Yeah. The sales and marketing side is definitely one of the things that I feel like really talented artists that I've known have not invested their time and energy into. And it's because of one of those things like choose your heart. If you're going to be an independent artist, specifically an independent artist, you have to learn sales and marketing if that's Dude. the route that you want to go. And some people just suck at it and that's okay. Like you can suck at it, not be naturally gifted at it, but you can learn the skill and go from there. Um, you know, there was that's... something I, you said that I, w- I, I wanted to speak on, but go ahead. No, I was just going to touch on that. That's probably also one of the things that don't get talked about enough, at least for independent artists, right? Because we talk about the the glamorous side of things or the benefits of it, you know, like, oh, the, the, the barrier to entry is the lowest it's ever been. You can purchase equipment, a microphone and record yourself at home. There's a distro kit now so you can, you know, distribute for only $23 a year uh, as much as you want, but... 
you also have to do all the other work yourself. You're basically wearing multiple hats. And for a lot of people, you kind of just want to focus on the creative part of it. Like, you know, like (laughs) if you're an artist, you just want to focus on creating music, but you still have to do all these other things that are required for you to be able to be successful in this area. And you're right. Some people just either don't do it or don't care to do it or maybe they're bad at it. But yeah, 100 percent. The whole notion of the musicpreneur, and thank you for saying that, because the whole notion of the musicpreneur is to get people to realize that if you're an independent artist, and that's a a sub niche of a niche, right? Mm -hmm. Like I consider myself a creative entrepreneur, you consider yourself a creative entrepreneur. And by the way, I do have a day job, but it's so flexible for me to be able to do that day job that I could do this. Like if I didn't have the flexibility that I did with my day job, I don't know what I do. (laughs) All that to be said. I still um, don't know how you do it. Dude, it's crazy. But- what I was going to say was the creative entrepreneur in me had to come out because um, one of two things was going to happen. Either I was going to get signed to a label, which I didn't want to lose that freedom or that independence, uh, or I had to figure it out and I had to learn to be an entrepreneur and it's taken me this long and I'm still like kind of uncovering like phase one of entrepreneurship, if Mm. you will, and then realize I'm an entrepreneur. This is what I do. Mm. versus like I'm an artist and I'm an independent artist. That's it. Mm. You know what I mean? Viewing myself as an entrepreneur yeah. has been such a radical shift um, as opposed to just trying to be an artist and kind of just hoping things fall on my lap. That's that's definitely um, another conversation. I, I don't know what's the right way, you know? Um, I think both are required, uh, I don't know if if the best ways to view yourself as an entrepreneur uh, as an entrepreneur with music as your vessel or a musician with an entrepreneurial spirit. I don't know. I don't know what's the best way, but there there it does require some balance because both are necessary. So obviously, like it doesn't even have to be music. It could be whatever. It could be a visual art. It could be whatever the case might be. But as mentioned before. If you plan to make some sort of living with it, sales have to happen. Marketing is directly tied to that. Um, And and that just kind of opens up a a big can of worms of like understanding your audience, target markets, um, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary, whatever the case might be. Uh, and it's it's one of those things where like if you weren't exposed to it, it's not the first thing you're going to think about. Like a lot of artists, the first thing they think about is not like what business model should I come up with to be successful in this realm. And that's one of the things that I think I'm kind of lucky and blessed to have had because I actually went to business school. I did marketing. And I think you did as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's one of those things that for some of us, maybe we got exposed to it through the nature of, of you know, our, our life actions and decisions. But a hundred percent, you definitely need that business mix to make it work. Yeah. There's a, a guy you've probably heard of. Maybe the audience hasn't, uh, his name's Alex Ramosi. So he's yeah, of course. huge in the like entrepreneurial self-development world right now. He blew up over the last year and he talks about kind of just understanding like the phases, right? So like you're an artist. And even if like you're like, he was a bodybuilder, like he's like, mm. he, he considers him considered himself an artist or a technician of sorts. Mm. And, and the artist can stay there and be really, really, really good at doing what they do. But nine times out of 10, you have to be in kind of like the 0.0001% of like talent to naturally gain the notoriety mm. and the, um, uh, organic marketing, if you will, because of your talent, yeah. like you're just, extremely extremely gifted at that and you've worked very very hard to hone in on on that skill and then for those of us who are don't fall into that category then you start learning the business side and the business person comes out and then hopefully like you mentioned like there there's kind of that that uh struggle between the two where it's a nice enough balance where you can still get the artist and the business person Uh, but before we continue that conversation i wanted to touch on one thing i i don't think you're lazy at all by the way (laughs) Um, I was listening, I know, man. <laughs> I was I, listening to this podcast that basically said inherently, we as humans, as a species. Oh, I know species, where you're going with this. I think I I've read this too or saw it. Yes, yes. Like we, as a survival mechanism, conserving are, energy. We have to conserve energy, yeah. right? And so, how does that translate to the modern world? Like we're no longer hunting 
for our food. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, man. This could be a whole other, like, podcast topic. <laughs> I'm getting super nerdy excited. Um, yeah. I, well, you know, you're right. I think I think at a, at a uh, basic core level, um, we're built to be lazy. Um, I think obviously the modern modern society's um, requirements have obviously turned this into something else, and obviously here in the West, hustle culture is prevalent. We work like nobody's business compared to other countries. But I, you know, it's it's one of those things too where like comparison is a thief of joy. Because like, so take you for example. Um, you are a dad of three, all under five. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, dad of three. That five, but yeah. Okay, so five and below. Um, yeah. Husband, you have a day job. You also have your own business, NTS Media, and then you do all these other little creative things on the side, and you somehow manage to pull all that off. I don't know if I could. Maybe it's because I, I'm i not built in that way or maybe because I choose not to, but like I go through my day and I do what I have to do, right? Or maybe throughout the week. But there comes a point where like I just shut off and I just don't have enough energy. And then sometimes I look at people who do all these wonderful things throughout their day and I'm like, two things are happening. Either you are being the right amount of productive and I'm being lazy or I am normal and you're working extra hard. <laughs> One of the two yeah. is happening. I don't know which, but something is happening here. And, and I don't know, honestly. I think, like you said, we're built for it, but... um at the end of the day, um, it's also one of those things where I've had to kind of remind myself that things take time to accomplish and progress is progress over perfection, right? Like you just as long as you're making strides to where you want to go and you're not staying stagnant or idle, that's what matters to me. Yeah, no. And dude, trust me when I tell you this, that like, I don't think you underwork at all. I think if... I like to think of life in seasons, right? And I think in the season of life that I'm in, I'm working the adequate, probably more hours than I need to. When I was in my dual income, no kids season with my wife, mm -hmm. I probably worked the equal amount of time that you did throughout the week and would love to work less at that time. But one thing, I, I love going to um, gym analogies because I was super into fitness when I was in college. Hey, I kind of fell off the them. bandwagon. Yeah. But um, when I would go to the gym by myself, it was so easy to skimp out on the workout, like especially like on leg day, right? If you couldn't tell, I have like skinny legs. So um, <laughs> on leg day, it, it's like super easy to be like, you know what? I'm only going to do three sets, like whatever. Uh, and then I'm done for the day and cool. Call it a day. Leg day done. Hmm. But the days that I would go with my buddies, especially like those who had like the beefy legs and they'd be like, no, you could do more, more weight, more this, more that, that level of accountability, somebody across the gym would be like, dang, that guy works hard. Dang, he must be, you know, fit. He must be this, that, the third. It's an interesting perspective. Where internally, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is difficult. But then you build the resistance and then you continue going and then the, the level of accountability holds you to that standard. Like I have an insane level amount of accountability with my day job because I'm being like, there's metrics that I have to attain. I yeah. have an insane amount of accountability with my kids because they rely on me hundred mm -hmm. percent. Insane amount of accountability with my finances because I'm responsible for four other people outside of myself. So for me, that accountability is the driving factor that if I didn't have that dude, honestly, I would do exactly what you're doing. So no holds bar. That was going to be my next question, right? Because although we share a lot of commonalities, I think one of the biggest differences is that you have three kids, right? You have a mortgage. Um, I, I, I rent a, a, a place and my sister lives with us. So like it's half of that, you know? Um, so yeah, w would you say that, I mean, you, you literally just said it, but I guess to reiterate, those are your driving forces to work a little harder, correct? Yeah, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like I went from when I met you actually, and again, going back to music podcast therapy, um, I was surviving, dude. Like I was, we were in the negative mm -hmm. every single month and I was trying to make something happen off of YouTube and I was just struggling and I was like gasping for air and I was reaching out to people like uh, Nico, crazy. I think you cut off, bud. Yo, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I got you. 
Go ahead. Okay, you were so, saying? So just repeating that, I, I was gasping for air. I was reaching out for help. And that's that's literally when I met you. And um, I wanted to touch on this later on in the podcast, but um, I know we're kind of running a little long, but um, in terms of like iceberg theory, but going back to what I was trying to say was that 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 feeling does not leave me. And I think growing up and you, you and I have Mm. very similar backgrounds of, you know, we're both immigrants. We both have immigrant parents. We both have gone through the toil of like knowing what it's like to like not have perhaps enough or what have you. And I think that triggered something in me where I'm like, all right, during that season of my life, I worked 40 hours a week and then I worked through getting an MBA. And so the equivalent amount of time that I spent working on getting my MBA um, after hours, I've now dedicated to like NTS media, mm. podcasting, creative endeavors and that sort of thing. So that's that's been my routine. You've built but it's the been out of necessity. Over the yeah, years. Exactly. And, sur- and survivorship. I got and now you. like yeah, now it's not so much like trying to pay the bills. Now it's like, all right, I want to undo years of like financial financial decisions that have been made, whether by myself or inclusive of my wife that need yeah. to be undone. And I also want to set myself up for success so that come five to 10 years, I want to be chilling like you, my boy. <laughs> like I want well, see, to be. See, here's the thing, though. It, here's the thing. And, I, and I'll be completely honest. We'll pe- we're peeling back the curtain. So you're you're in a, yeah. in, in a building phase, right? Yes. Um, yes. I, I am, too. Or at least I'd like to think I am. Um, right. Because I also want to get, if I'm being totally honest with you, one of the reasons where th- that I have put off or, or that me and my wife have put off having kids is because we want to build the life and the future that we want before bringing in little ones. And obviously, you know, that's not always perfect. You can't really plan these things all the time. You are going to rise to the occasion because we're built that way as humans. Mm. But it, it is the reality of things. And, and you know, I am also trying to undo years and years of not necessarily bad advice or bad knowledge, maybe lack thereof, right? Because growing up Hispanic, you weren't taught about finances. You weren't taught that you have to pay back student loans. You weren't taught that credit cards charge you interest when you don't pay things back and that your credit goes to shit when you don't make your payments. So, you know, these are the things that I'm trying to undo while also trying to teach me and my wife. We're trying to learn good money habits, um, unlearning mental scripts about money, about, you know, switching from a scarcity to an abundance mindset so that we can build. Um, I think the big difference though between me and you is that you, like you mentioned, have a, a lot more dependence. People that mm-hmm. strictly rely on you to pull them forward. We don't. You know, in in, you know, uh, technically my wife makes more than I do. Um, But, you know, it's one of those things where like we're good with our combined income. We're we're fine, but we don't have anybody else um, that we really need to care for. So it's one of those things where like, you know, there is no no inherent pressure to to you know, push that uh, harder or whatever. But it does make me think sometimes where. I'm like, well, dang, I'm in this building phase that I'm say I'm in, but sometimes I feel like I don't work as hard as I should work. And I don't know if that's a truth, a lie, or maybe just the conditioning from, you know, living in America <laughs> and experiencing hustle culture. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't abhor hustle culture because it's helped me, but I also understand the importance of rest and the need for rest and the mm. need for recreation. And I don't think we know how to fully rest and recreate. Like mm. I've been reading this book by um, Ryan Holiday, Discipline is Destiny. And the whole notion of recreation has kind of been lost. You know, uh, I'm guilty of this. And for me, my breaks are scrolling through my phone. And that's a productivity and creativity cl- killer. You know what I mean? Um, today, I decided to just sit in my patio and soak up the sun. Like, yeah. There's nothing healthier than that. And so I think I think it is not so much a balance, but like knowing where you are. I will say this. I do wish that when I was younger and didn't have kids, I focused I, I focused more of my attention on trying to get to a place where I was more financially stable mm. and free. And to your point about 
yeah. undoing things. Like that was it for me. It was like undoing ignorance, years of ignorance, mm-hmm. because you come to a new system, you don't know the system, you don't know the credit card system, student loan system. And that's, that's really what I'm working against as well. Yeah. Um, I don't want to derail the conversation too much on this because I feel like this is really, really good stuff. But I definitely want to drive it back to the creative and music entrepreneurship um, stuff, which, by the way, we can make each one of these segments like an episode in and of themselves and go on for hours. Um, and we and we will. And we will. Um, but one thing I wanted to touch on was kind of this whole notion that I've been thinking about of iceberg theory, mm. where talk to me. you're dialed in very very well and it's coming from a book that i've been listening to i think it's called outliers i should know this because i'm listening by to it, malcolm gladwell yeah Ma- malcolm gladwell mm-hmm. and Great book. there's just so many variables that people don't attribute to their success number oh, one 100 and you are so dialed in with your youtube but one thing that i learned in music creation and being an artist was there were so many things that i was very dialed in on that completely fell flat because it wasn't mm. the right place wasn't the right time didn't hit the market right there's one song that I have a million stream songs on, uh, mm. a million streams on. One song where I collaborated on that I've made more money on that song because of licensing and because of streams than any other song in my catalog, mm-hmm. Limits to Sky. Yep. And that was literally a fluke by chance. <laughs> and so I wanted I, I wanted to just speak on this real quick because I saw um, one of my friends post about like his TikTok strategy, and I don't want to single him out because I've done this too. It's like, oh yeah, this is what I've done to be successful on TikTok. Yeah, da, da, yeah. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, dude, no offense, but none of that matters. Like that's you focusing on the 0.01% that you like can mm. control, which is good. But in terms of selling that to people or telling people that they could literally replicate your entire system to a T and go nowhere. Mm-hmm. What what do you th- what are your thoughts on that? Because I, I I mean I want to be challenged in that you if I'm wrong, but no, no, I also no. want to be like have I a agree. conversation on this. I agree, and this is kind of like the ugly, hard, dark truth that maybe we don't talk about enough. But you know, oftentimes, I, so I read the book. I read the book a few years ago, and I started to understand after finishing it, like you said, how many variables are tied to your success that you had no control over, right? Uh, and the best example, at least, or, or the one that I use to kind of anchor myself is when I think about, you know, I didn't choose to be born into this person that I am today to these parents who are supportive to this family that, you know, kind of uh, pushes me forward in my creative endeavors. I could have been born in North Korea, you know, and that would have been it. No amount of talent, and I'm using them as an example, obviously there's other countries too, but like no amount of talent, no amount of skill, no amount of will would have mattered because of the circumstances that I was born into, the cars that I was dealt, dictate the rest of my life. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where, again, you really have to sit down and ask those hard questions about yourself, about where you are and where you want to be, because there are going to be those situations where you might have all the will, you might have all the enthusiasm, but maybe your cards are not necessarily where they need to be. Is that the end all be all? Not always. You know, there's have been plenty of situations where people, you know, pull themselves up and and they they push forward. Um, But but, you know, I think that the more interesting perspective on this is the concept of pivoting, because a lot of times people will say or, you know, they'll come across an obstacle and be like, I I can't do the initial thing that I wanted to do for X reason. Life's over. Or you could think of it as, well. I can use whatever I do have to pivot into maybe a parallel or complementary kind of avenue where I can still sort of pursue this thing that I want to do. A good example, and like what we were talking about before, is for a lot of us, you think like, oh, I'm going to be a superstar. I'm going to be a top producer. And then you realize the amount of Maybe not even luck, but the connections. You realize how the game works. And maybe you don't agree with everything, or maybe you realize that that's not what aligns with your vision of your life. And then you have to pivot. For me, it was pivoting into the YouTube stuff. You know, so like I realized that 
I don't want to be tied to a label or whoever who tells me to be at a certain place at a certain time to produce a certain amount of records. Um, and, and pivoting into something different allowed me to kind of have still that music, uh, you know, uh, part of my life, but do it in my, in, in a way that made sense to me. So yeah, to, to back to your point, there are limitations that we're just all born with. And, but, but I think that again, the more interesting part is figuring out you, what your strengths are playing to your strengths, and then maybe finding a way where you can pivot to kind of use and utilize them to the, you know, to serve whatever purpose you need. Yeah, you, you said something really important there, and it and I'll paraphrase it by saying this: the obstacle is the way, which is another <laughs> another good book one of Brian. Yeah. yeah, another good book, right? And I think leaning into that problem that you're faced with, this is the whole birth uh, and genesis of the Music Printer Podcast is me kind of talking to other people about the the struggles, the toils that I've dealt with as an independent artist and somebody who's still trying to figure it out on the creative entrepreneurship end, even with a full time job and a family. Um, but leaning into the things that I struggled with or still struggle with. And I think that's kind of the beauty of our conversation today, man, is just knowing that like, we're not gurus, we're not coming across as like telling you what to do, what not to do. We're sharing our experiences in hopes that there something resonates with you and you realize that like, you're not alone, even if you think we're high performers or, you know, Ivan's yeah. crushing it on YouTube and, and has tons. Of, I'll never get to Ivan's status on YouTube and maybe you won't. And that's OK. Like, I think it's still important to realize that, like, what behind the curtain, what it really is yeah. like um, and, and if it's something that you actually want to pursue. And then focusing on, like you said, what you can control, knowing that there's a ton of variables that you can't control. So ultimately, like whether or not your results favor you it's not really up to you. So be humble when you're like, you're successful and don't get, you know, beat up when you're like not yeah. doing well, you know? Absolutely, man. hundred percent. Cause yeah, we all struggle. We all, we all have to choose our hearts <laughs> again, yeah. but, um, you know, it's part of the, part of the process, part of the, the journey, hundred percent. Any, uh, any closing remarks, last thoughts, man? I, I feel like you, you, you said a lot here, really, really good stuff, but any closing remarks that you think we haven't covered? Um, I don't know. Hopefully we, we, maybe not at the moment, but maybe we, uh, turn this into a reoccurring thing. Keep dropping the gems on, on, on the people, you know what I'm saying? Um, but now I I just, you know, uh, keep, keep pursuing your dream, obviously. But I I would say the biggest thing, the biggest thing, a hundred percent is, is do some internal reflecting. I know I mentioned this a couple of times, but it's important. It's important because so in marketing, right? We have a thing called uh, your target audience. It is basically understanding who you are uh, marketing or selling to. The The version of this for yourself or the version of this for you would be knowing yourself, knowing who you are, knowing what you want, and then kind of doing a, a little bit of strategizing to, to see how you can get to your goal based on whatever you want out of life. I think a lot of people just don't, don't do a lot of reflecting. Um, they kind of just live life day by day. But the more you understand yourself and what you want out of life, the easier is going to be for you to figure out your path forward. So do more questions. You know, do more stuff reflecting. Yeah. Be curious. I think that's important. And the busier you are, and I need to, I'm saying this to myself, the busier you are, the more time you need to slow down to reflect because otherwise you're just running fast nowhere. <laughs> Facts. All right, man. Well, great having you on the, uh, on the show today. And I, I know we'll have yeah. you, I'll have you back again. I'm hoping this format is something that people enjoy. If you liked it, let me know in the comment section below, you know what to do on YouTube and wherever you're listening to this podcast. Much love y'all. Peace. If you'd like to be a part of a community of musicians and creatives that want to take their music business to the next level, I highly encourage you to check out our Patreon community, patreon.com forward slash Nico Santana. Please select the Musicpreneur tier. We also have some amazing resources for you guys that are trying to monetize your brand, but don't quite know how to start. This is available on the Musicpreneur Academy. Check it out. Link in the description below. If you'd like to see another Musicpreneur interview, check it out here. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, share it with a friend, much love and happy music making. Peace.